sorry, Alan and I are in different parts of the sanctuary, so he would normally be looking for a high sign for me. So we're still figuring everything out, but hey. <laughs> um, welcome everybody to the um, beautiful Sunday here at Jackson Community Church. Uh, we have been doing in-person worship at 915 for anybody that is just longing to be in the sanctuary you're more than welcome to come and we're also doing a, an eight o'clock outdoor service every Sunday and have been for the most of the summer so there are many ways to worship together this is one of them and we're glad to have everybody that's able to come and be here in person with us and create community and we know that some other people will probably be uh, watching through Facebook and other things so there are other people that are with us but we can't see them all and uh, this is an ongoing experiment too for for the music that's live in the church again because earlier in this year we were doing digital music almost exclusively and now we're doing combinations of that digital and live and it's really great to have the live music back the organ and the piano so a uh, big thanks to Alan for the ways that he was composing music, both uh, um, recording it digitally and now coming back in person to share it with us. Um, if you guys all want to unmute and say hello, that would be awesome. Remember, you have to unmute yourselves. I can't do it for you. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. Everybody. Hi. 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 Good, Good morning, all. Hi, Roy. Hi, Nancy. Good Hi, Meg. Good morning. Hi. Hi, everybody on the other screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good to see Meg. Hi, good to see you all. Hi, Arden and Ray. Where's Arden? How you doing? He's here. Oh, She's here. There they are. I see them. They're sitting together on their couch in their living room. Yeah, so church in your own living room or your own space. That's pretty nice. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> um, okay, announcements for the life of the church. There aren't a whole lot, but there are a few things happening. Racial justice initiatives are really getting up and running this week. So today at seven o'clock, anybody that's interested in racial justice, those that have already been working through courageous conversations with us, and anybody else who's been longing to have this kind of conversation and hasn't had a chance yet, you're welcome. We sent the Zoom link out through the church emails. I will send a completely separate email again about racial justice with all the other things. Um, we're screening for the first time in the Valley, a movie called Traces of the Trade. This is an award-winning award documentary. It was screened at the Sundance Film Festival and has been used by PBS and their Point of View series. And it is the story of a local family, local to New England, who discovered that they were the single largest slaveholding family in all of North America and that that is what created the wealth and the privilege that they still experience. And members of that family will watch the movie with us and then facilitate that conversation. So it should be very powerful. We are asking people to RSVP um, through the Eventbrite link that we'll share, share with you so that we can have some idea of interest in this. We would add another session if we need to, but um, anyway. Please, please look for that and join us for one of them. It should be really good. It's a, yeah. Those are the things that I can think of right now for the life of the church. Courageous Conversations will start next week. So you're also, if you didn't get to do it before and you want to try it, you can do that. Anybody else? Oh, Cheryl's got something. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself, Cheryl? Um, I thought the creative conversation started this evening, the 13th. Uh, yeah, that's separate. That's like the learning working group, but it's not Courageous Conversations. The Courageous Conversations is that six-week series that we've done. Okay. Um, we're going to do another couple sessions of that, but the groups that have already done Courageous Conversations, right, which you're part of, um, we're going to have this ongoing conversation at least once a month. So people can okay. come to either or both. Okay, I just got confused. Yeah, yeah, no okay. worries, it was a good question. Uh, I have a question about the um, cocktails and conversation on Friday evenings, is that this week or a week from now? No, we're gonna start it, I think it's the 23rd. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, we, th yeah, this week, because we have the screening happening, potentially, we're not sure. I didn't want to have any conflicting events. So we will start one week out from now for the cocktails and conversations. Any other announcements or questions for the life of the church? I do also want to say that we had the Alzheimer's Walk turnout. It was a great group of people out at Whitaker Woods. So thank you for either those that uh, walked or those that supported, and it's never too late to support. So feel free to um, support that cause if it moves you, if you haven't already done so and you feel so moved. Well, then I'm going to say it is time to begin our worship formally here at Jackson Community Church. And we like to do that with Alan's centering music. So, Alan, if you want to. <laughs> right. That, that's a cue. Um, <laughs> so, Alan, we need to unmute that phone. Yeah. So we, we, Alan and I are doing all the technology here, so sometimes we have a slightly exciting transition. All right, I'm, all right, I'm, I'm muting muted. and Alan's unmuted, and here we go. For So please, center yourselves with this music by Alan. <laughs> Thank you to Alan. And Alan, are you going to be, you're going to be doing more under the piano later, right? So we'll leave that alone. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we will. Okay. So everybody, we are now going to begin by having prayers i'm gonna i will have to mute the second phone we'll have to unmute it again later so we don't get any feedback so this is the time in the service when we have prayers of the people and so we would like to ask you to share any starting with prayers of concern let me just for anybody that did not see their email in the last few days uh beulah jodry who was a faithful matriarch in our church she had her daughters bringing her as long as she possibly could come, and she died this week at the age of 99. And um, we did her funeral yesterday. So prayers for her family, uh, gratitude for her very long and fabulous life. And she was reciting poetry literally with her daughters until the night before she died. So she's had an amazing memory and curiosity and scholarly minds and just a lot of passion and so just a moment of gratitude for Beulah's life. Are there other prayer concerns that any of you would like to raise up? Unmute yourselves and just go ahead and speak if you are interested. Um, I'd like us to remember in our prayers uh, Janice and Dan Andrews, Janice's mother Stella who lived with them for many many years and and those of you who live in Jackson probably knew Stella. She just passed away. I think she was about 96. Um, she passed away this week too, um, at home, having her prayers and her priest and so forth with her. So um, it was a good passing and we wanna remember her long and great life. Okay, so another, another wonderful woman to remember. Um, and to think also about these families that have had to say goodbye to somebody they love because it doesn't matter how great and long your life is, it's hard to say goodbye to people you love. It's just a change that we're never ready for. And so for those that are saying goodbye. 
or have said goodbye. Other prayers of concern. Alan's got one. Um, I'd like to pray for um, all the uh, firefighters and all huh? those people in California wildfires and all okay. the mess. A lot of people that are going over there to fight those uh, lives that are affected by them. So Alan's asking us to pray for those that have been affected by the California wild, um, wildfires the firefighters and responders, the people who have lost homes or uh, businesses, J just the way that those fires are having such an adverse impact on so many people here in our country. And of course, we think also of other natural disasters that have been happening that we want to bear in mind because that's not the only place that's hurting, but that's, that's one that is, that's one of many, but it, you know, it's a reminder of all those places. Any, Hello, anybody? Okay, Kevin, it's good to hear you and see you. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, I wanna pray for you, Reverend Gail and Chris, and my new girlfriend, Mariz, and her entire family, and for my scars to heal. Okay. So prayers of hope and love and prayers of, for scars to heal from Kevin. Any, anybody else have a prayer of concern? This is the auctioning off of that section of the prayer time, going once, going twice. And then how about celebration? Anybody happy about anything that you would like us to? I, I know there's birthdays. There might have been the birthday this weekend. I bet there are a few of them. Anybody? Oh, somebody's wearing a crown. I believe she's showing that she had a birthday. Ginger. <laughs> um, so celebration for people that came into the world or are celebrating anniversaries. There were a lot of anniversaries this week, I seem to recall, too, that were very important. Anything else that besides anniversaries and birthdays? We're going to sing happy birthday and anniversary. We do it every week. I think it's going to have to be a weekly tradition, but, you know, it's important. When it's your week, it's your week. All right, so let's all unmute. We're going to sing a really bad version of happy birthday and happy anniversary and then we'll pray together. This is our new tradition. It used to be animal sightings. Right now, it's happy birthday anniversary. <laughs> Unmute yourselves. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. And anniversary to you. Happy birthday and anniversary happy to you. Birthday. Happy many years of happy your wonderful lives. And Thank feel you. free to mute yourselves again. <laughs> All right, we're going on the road with this act. This is pretty funny. Um, then please join me, brothers and sisters, in prayer. Oh, holy God, we lift up gratitude for the lives of those who have gone ahead of us who have experienced true homecoming when they enter the holy sustaining love that is your welcome at the end of this life and the beginning of the next. We give thanks for all those that are part of our lives that remind us of what is precious because of their brief or their long time with us, because of the challenges that we face together and that we manage to get through together. We pray for those that are vigiling at the end of a life, those that are on journeys that require different forms of medical care or treatment. And we have so many people that have been going through surgeries, through chemo and radiation, mental health counseling and management, so many different kinds of, of needing well-being and care, um, therapies, physical, OT, just so many different kinds of, of attention to so many parts of our bodies. And we are one body, God, and you told us this, that we together create your body. So let us acknowledge the aches and pains and the groans of our body as it is our community and our world. And let us 
be kind to the parts of our body, each other, and our planet that need us to love each other well and tend to what might change things. And let us remember always to pray with gratitude, to look at eyes that see in this world something that we need to give thanks for because it is then that optimism, that stopping to reassess and reframe and realize that there is the power of gratitude that changes everything, that we have the power to say thank you. Remind us to do this too, as we call upon you. And today we pray together in the way that you first taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, I'm going to get you guys to all unmute and say amen together because I didn't hear a single other voice with me in that prayer. So, and I know you were praying. I know you were, but yeah, let's just give ourselves a little evidence that we were praying together. So unmute and say one, two, three. Amen. amen. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so Alan and I are now going to try another experiment so that as I am reading the scripture, he's going to be playing the piano underneath that. And Alan, I've got, um, you need to unmute your phone again because I muted it because we're getting feedback. Sorry. Everybody else should mute. I'm going to okay. mute people that aren't muted. There we go. And uh, do a thumbs up if you can hear as I'm reading along. And um, otherwise... If it's a down, let me know that too. So we're going to put up on the screen the scripture, the first page of scripture. This is a long one. It's a long reading. And it comes again from First Thessalonians. So I'm introducing you once more to the pieces of what the letter looks like. So let's read together excerpts from First Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. Now I'm doing a check-in. Can you all hear me? Thumbs up? Okay. You know yourselves, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you is not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. As for us, brothers and sisters, when for a short time we were made orphans by being separated from you in person, not in heart, we longed with great eagerness to see you face to face. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, wanted to again and again, but Satan blocked our way. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we decided to be left alone in Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God, in proclaiming the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you for the sake of your faith, so that no one would be shaken by these persecutions. Indeed, you yourselves know that this is what we are destined for. In fact, when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer persecution. So it turned out, as you know. Finally, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learn from us how you ought to live and to please God, as in fact you are doing, you should do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, that each one of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter. Finally, brothers and sisters, to live and to please God 
to, to live and please God is in fact you're doing, uh, I'm jumping to another part. Indeed, that you do love well, but we urge you, beloved, that your own in your own affairs and to work with your hands as we directed you so that you may behave properly toward outsiders and be dependent on no one. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, beloved, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Beloved, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So ends the reading. Thank you, Alan. Okay, that was a long passage. And there was a snafu in my uh, slides there. I repeated a section, but I think you heard it. So I'm going to ask that you now pray with me so that we can tangle a little bit with this scripture. But we're going to focus in on one sentence to make it a little bit more bearable for ourselves. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So before we dive into one single sentence, I want you all to have just a little bit of background about why we're now focusing on this letter today. This letter that was written by Paul to the Greek community in Thessaloniki was the very first document, the earliest document of the New Testament. It's older and earlier than the books of the gospel that were later written down. That does not mean that the stories of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not also old, but they were handed down orally, and then they were written from multiple sources and written down and compiled, but at a later time than this letter. This letter probably comes from about 51 CE and is the earliest of Paul's letters that survived. And so it, it builds the, it begins the body of the work of Paul's letters to different communities. And remember some of the things that we mentioned last week, Paul was troubleshooting when he wrote these letters. He wrote them when he couldn't get there himself or if he couldn't get a representative there to work with the community. And usually there had to be something really, a big deal was going on or he wouldn't write because that was his third preference in terms of communicating. Now, why did he write to Thessaloniki? We're gonna, again, we're gonna focus in on one sentence, but I just, again, I want you to have this background because it will help you remember that as you read any of these epistles, there is a specific context. This was an early community. They were seeing signs of change and somebody among them felt that, there, that somebody was sort of acting as a prophet and said the end of the world was coming right then, right then. They did believe, Paul believed, that Christ's return was imminent and that the second coming would happen soon. But somebody in their community like basically picked a date and said the world's about to end. And so they started having all kinds of interesting and a little bit irresponsible behavior, which we all might do if we thought the world was going to end. So for instance, they all started sleeping around. They started sleeping with everybody because they were basically having this big party and they stopped honoring marriage. They stopped. Um, and so when Paul writes about, you know, express your love inside a holy covenant and don't exploit your brothers and sisters. He's talking about that behavior in response to the idea that the world was going to end. 
another thing that was happening was that people didn't weren't yet confident that if their loved ones had died before the second coming came that their loved ones who had died would end up in heaven people were mourning because they thought those that had died before the second coming lost out on heaven and so people were in deep mourning and paul had to explain to people the dead will be raised and you don't have to worry and you don't have to weep and mourn except in a regular human way because you're sad but you don't have to think that you're never going to be reunited with people in the way that early christians were beginning to believe in heaven and this was a new concept and belief in that time. And third, um, people quit their jobs. They're like, okay, it doesn't matter what we do anymore. We're just going to like eat and drink and spend all our savings and just because we're going to use it all up because the world is coming to an end and it doesn't matter about taking care of ourselves anymore. So he had to counsel them to continue to work. And if others were not working to urge those that weren't working to work and to take care of themselves and take care of each other because the community was not sustainable if nobody had a job. So very specific context to this letter. Um, and, and when people lift these sentences out and try to apply them in other contexts that may work, it may not work. Just remember that as we extrapolate forward through time, uh, he wasn't trying to flesh out a completely coherent theology yet. He was addressing faith specifically to the people of his time. That being said, uh, we're going to look at one sentence, and we're going to look at that sentence now. And we're going to just talk about this urging from Paul. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. So I'm going to reel us up to the present time and think about our prayer lives and what it means and doesn't mean. Some people have a very regular prayer life. A lot of us didn't grow up with necessarily a prayer life outside of coming to church on a Sunday and praying at that time, or maybe doing a prayer over a meal. Maybe people had one or two habits, but a lot of those sort of get lost in the busyness and the everydayness of our life. And I want to just focus on this idea that prayer can be more than just sitting in church with your heads bowed together doing the Lord's Prayer or grace over a meal. And also that there's not a right or a wrong way to pray. There's not a right or wrong time to pray. And that there are so many things that we do in our lives that can become forms of prayer, especially when we connect them with our faith, and we're somewhat intentional about them. So in the next image, I just want to observe that prayer happens in all faith traditions. We see here examples of Jewish prayer, Muslim prayer, Buddhist and Hindu prayer, and Christian prayer. And we see down on the bottom right, and we'll see this enlarged in the next image, that Christ himself prayed, that he had a living prayer practice and that what we model, and when we say pray and pray without ceasing, we model ourselves on Christ. This is the way that he walked and he would remove himself. You know, he'd be really busy. He'd be taking care of other people. And then you remember, he'll go out on a boat. He'll go up a mountain. He'll withdraw and focus because he needed to center himself and ground himself in his own holy connection. There's yet another image coming up here that shows Christ in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? It's a dark night of the soul as he prepares himself for what is coming, and we see him crying out to God. So the earliest of our leaders, Christ, the Son of God himself, prayed, and this is whom we're asked to model ourselves on. But I then want to make the argument that Prayer across all faiths is valuable and valid, and that there are a lot of different ways to pray. When Chris and I lived in and out of the hospital with Jesse for six years, people were following our story. We were writing every day, and hundreds of people were following us. This was before Facebook. It was before a lot of the social media that made it easier to follow people's journeys. But we blogged every day, and people would send us prayers from all over the world. 
And the prayers might be, we, we, we receive some of them in tangible forms. People will go to sacred sites like Matagorje, where, where healings took place, and they would send us little medallions, or people gave us Tibetan prayer flags, or sent us little angels. But a lot of the prayers were just, they were posted online, or they came in the form of the prayer that you and I might do wherever we are. And we stopped ever worrying about what faith the prayer came from, what words were used, and we simply took the good energy and the intentions of those prayers and accepted them as a gift. So as we move into the next image, I just want you to hold that idea that prayer works across all traditions. And if you pray, believe that the energy that you put out there goes where it is intended to go, and the one who listens will hear you. Here's an image by an artist. We see an angel. She's the figure of a long-haired Caucasian woman hovering over the shoulders of Christ with a hand on Christ's shoulder so that this artist depicts Christ in prayer, but not alone, already being heard. And I find that image comforting. And I let's move to the next image and let's begin to think how prayer looks in our life and in our context. Of course, this image of women standing in a circle holding each other's waist is clearly pre-COVID because we probably wouldn't get together that much anymore, but praying in community is a powerful way to maintain your prayer life. And here are a few images of how we pray together. You know, the next image shows us a youth group gathered in a big circle, and they are praying out in a field together, holding hands and sharing concerns and celebrations, just like we did this morning by Zoom, and both ways are powerful. The next image shows us people holding hands. Their hands are locked together in a form of prayer. These are the most traditional forms of prayer we might think of. I want to think that we use our body. So in the next image, let's look at what prayer looks like when, when we're crying out. Sometimes it's not a formal prayer because we're just in a circumstance where to groan or to make a noise or simply to just say, help! is what you can do. And that's as valid and essential a prayer as there ever was. And in the next image, we see two soldiers. And one is crying out, looking at whatever is coming at them. And the other has his rosary or his cross up to his mouth and he's kissing it and he's praying into his fist, seeking help. To cry out for help, is a simple and a powerful prayer, and it's probably the one that we're most likely to do any time in our lives. In the next image, we see a woman standing at the center of a labyrinth. Many cathedrals all over the world have these patterns put into their floors. People use them in retreat centers. You walk the circle and you weave back and forth and back and forth until you finally find yourself in the center. So to pray with your whole body when you are moving is another powerful way to pray. You do not have to be sitting still. You can use your whole body and use your environment as a way of focusing yourself and engaging and being present. In the next image, we see several men in different postures of prayer. These are more intentional forms of prayer that come from multiple traditions where people are required to center themselves and pray at different times of day. Whether you're bowed over or sitting on a rug, sitting in a lotus position, having your head to the floor. These are people across faiths who use their body as well as their language to engage in the experience of prayer. You know, in the Catholic tradition, the Episcopal tradition, so many traditions where you kneel, right? Your body, or when you cross yourself, you're using your body to create a body, mind, a sensory memory that you can call on at any time to put yourself in the mindset of prayer. And in the next image, we see women doing much the same thing, but some of the postures are different. We see somebody practicing yoga down on the bottom right. And perhaps in those kind of positions or those activities as well, these other things we do in our day, we have the chance to be mindful and focused. In the next image, we see our children praying out loud. Sue Kerrigan was there for that camp. 
this is a peace camp a year ago and our kids were challenged. So what would peace look like if you prayed it with your bodies? So they made a peace sign. They sat in a circle and one of the young guys um, put a, created the, the, the central character with the body. So our bodies can become living symbols and the language of prayer. Let's see where else our young people take us when they think about what prayer means to them. Activism is a form of prayer. Uh, we heard this from Maeve in particular, that when in the next image is yet another image that reminds us that our activism is tied to other great traditions of activism. The civil rights movement where people put their bodies on the line as they marched in a peaceful way, seeking a change socially for a large community across racial divides. Our children and people in our own time are still asking for change and they put their bodies out there and they pray with their bodies and their choices and the ways that they resist and are resilient. The next image is yet another reminder. This again comes from Maeve's talk about environmental justice and that our children talk to us like prophets sometimes. And their activism becomes a living prayer. In this generation, the thing that ties young people to faith is action. They don't care about being told by somebody uh, who's in a power of a, a position of authority, what should happen, and that that person's going to mediate their connection to God. Their connection to God is very direct, and it's very real, and it's based on action and hands-on experiences. In the next image, we see again our children having created prayer flags they put them all together so we could see them all, and then they took them home as a reminder again of what they believed peace meant to them. And in this next image, what do you do during the day repeatedly? Do you brush your teeth? Do you take time to wash the dishes or prepare food? What do you do every day that could become an invitation for a contemplative life where you choose one activity that you do at the same time of day and you add intention to it? You can pray in your very daily, quotidian, regular chores as well as play and learning. In the next image, we're reminded that we can always look at a table and of course we can say grace over the table, but you can look at a plate and you can think about from field to table, how did each piece of food get to you? The earth that nourished it, the market that created it, the hands that planted it, that plucked it up, that packaged it up, that transported it to wherever you acquired it, unless you grew it yourself. There's a whole, story behind every piece of food on your plate. And so there's more than just saying thank you for a meal. There's looking at your meal and thinking about all the hands and the entire creation that helped sustain that meal for you. Even the act of eating your meal or sipping your coffee in the morning can be an act of prayer in the way that you think about how you acquire your food, you prepare it, and what it does for you and the ways that you're supporting and helping others and taking care of yourself too. In the next image, hiking, hiking, right? Um, we have been hiking together for four years now. This was the earliest hike that we ever took together. It was before I was even your minister. I think it was when I was just meeting you. And so this moving our bodies and we did it this week when we did the Alzheimer's walk. We are still moving our bodies together for things that we believe in and simply for the passion and the pleasure of being outside. When you have a passion, it can be a form of prayer. So in the next image, we can see Maeve dancing. And you know this happened during COVID because they're wearing their masks. People are expressing themselves. We've all been getting by with uh, songs that and theater productions and dance, all kinds of things that people, uh, recipes, right? New projects. 
we have adopted so many forms of passion and shared them with each other in COVID. And this sharing of our passions in holistic ways is yet another form of prayer. And in the final image, the great quote from Rumi, we, our lives are a living prayer. So when Paul says to pray without ceasing, believe that the way that you live your life can be a form of prayer, whether you say God, whether you say thank you or help, or you never say a word, the way you live your prayer, the way you live your life, you are a living prayer. And God is the great amen. So I'm going to invite us to do what we did after the Lord's Prayer. Unmute yourselves and let's say one more amen together as a reminder that we are a living prayer. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Pray without ceasing. Pray with gratitude. Pray together alone, but live your life as a prayer. You are sacred. Thanks be to God. Okay. And now we move ourselves into the time of offering. And so once more, we say, this is another practice that we're hoping that you will maintain. So if you're not here with us in the sanctuary and you can't put your offering in a plate, we hope that you're tucking it into a little glass or a cup or that you're making a weekly contribution online by going to jxncc.org to make an online donation or that you're mailing in your pledge or your contribution. And we also acknowledge the many time, talent and treasure gifts that we receive regularly from people because it takes many, many people to create this experience every week. And so thank you for the generosity that you have continued to show the commitment that you have continued to make that helps us be sustainable and a vital part of this community. And now I'm going to turn us towards the congregational song that we are going to share together. Uh, this is, I went down to the river to pray. I know we sang it a few weeks ago, but hey, it fits today, so we're gonna do it again. So uh, you can mute yourselves for this, but we're going to put the words and the music up for you. You're going to hear a musical introduction. When the voices start, that's when you're supposed to start singing, in case you're worried. <laughs>
and now, thank you everybody for singing along. We are going to listen to the benediction as prepared by Alan and Bob Carper. And this again is an invitation to sing along a while muted, but Bob will lead us in that song and Alan is playing it for us. give us that transition and then we'll unmute and you can either head out or chat for a few minutes but let's just listen to a little transition by Alan. Mm -hmm. 